I heard this comments from Prince William last night, and he's been on, on this sort of bandwagon. I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but a bandwagon for quite a, some time now, in which he seems to suggest that everything about a stiff upper lip is wrong and harmful, that we shouldn't encourage... I've got three sons, for example, all late teens, early 20s now, that, you know, as their father, the responsible thing to do is to tell them to emote about everything and to wear their heart on the sleeve and to open up and so on. But the, the bad thing to encourage them to do would be to, to toughen up to be resilient, to man up, if you like, uh, the world's most offensive phrase now, and to show a stiff upper lip. I, I come from a generation of very strong women, actually, in my family, where you could emote if you wanted to, but actually pretty soon someone would say, come on, crack on, get up, move on, life's tough, deal with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm of a similar mind to you, Piers. Um, I think this is, there's this romantic idea dating back to the 18th century, that there is something bad, something inhibiting, something that's going to be corrosive to your mental well-being um, if you repress your feelings and keep a stiff upper lip and don't uh, vent all the time. And it's just false. I mean, if you look at the research evidence, actually, men who exercise emotional regulation, who keep a stiff upper lip, mm. who don't always speak what's on their mind but can control themselves, actually have much better mental health. Mm. They're, they're likely to do better at school. They're likely to have more successful relationships. They're less likely to suffer from psychosomatic illness or depression. Generally speaking, all the psychological evidence tells us that that old-fashioned attitude is actually better for mm. your mental health, Lisa, not worse. The, the issue I have with this is that I think... Obviously, there are times when you need to be resilient and you need to be stoic. But if that becomes a prison and you feel that's all you can be, that's when it becomes dangerous to people's mental health. And I think that's probably what Prince William is trying to get at, that we can at times be strong, but we also need to be weak and vulnerable when, when that's necessary. I wouldn't use the word weak because I think to express your thoughts, your feelings and your emotions is actually a sign of strength. Mm. And I speak as somebody who's been hospitalised twice with mental health issues and I still to this day take a small maintenance dose of medication to keep me well, keep me working, mm. keep me thoroughly enjoying life. And I think part of the problem that I had with my mental health was that I bottled everything up inside. Mm. I didn't... I, I didn't lay bare my thoughts, my concerns, my emotions. And, of course, we're now living in an age where male suicide rates are astronomical, mm. particularly in the under-40s. Yeah. The know, biggest killer it, of it, men of it that is, age. And, and, and it's shocking. And I go out regularly with, with my friends and we sit down and we tell each other about the issues that we have in our lives, mm. what we're experiencing, because I firmly believe that a problem shared is a problem halved. Mm. You see, it's interesting hearing that from you, you know, a tough detective and everything else. Uh, I'm not surprised or shocked, but I, I'm interested that you take that view. But I, I sort of feel that what's happened in this debate, I've got no problem with anything you just said. I think it's right, and for a lot of people, it must be very helpful. My only problem is that I feel the pendulum swung so far now that having a stiff upper lip, if you choose to have that, if you genuinely feel like I do, that the best way to deal with most stuff is to grit your teeth and crack on. KBA. And maybe I'm lucky that I'm mentally strong enough to be like mm. that, and I accept that. But somehow that's become a stick to beat me with, that actually I'm, the, I'm a problem. When actually, I think for a lot of people, being a little bit tougher... Uh, with and teaching kids maybe at school, Toby. You've mm. been involved with a lot of uh, mm -hmm. schools, very capably, I might add. I think, well, by the way, for the record, what's happened to you recently over some old tweets and the fact that it's cost you so much with the school work you're doing, I think was disgusting. And I'm so glad to have you on the programme today for, for that. Totally separate. Let's just... There's this thing about whether having a stiff upper lip now is wrong. That's my key problem with it. I think certain people, a lot of people, actually take pride in being tough in that way and don't want to be forced into being in too emotive. Yeah, I mean, I think Peter's quite right. If you are suffering from a serious mental illness, if you've got issues with mental health, then, of course, you should talk about that and get the help you need. No-one's arguing about that. Mm. But I do think that um, this, this, this uh, encouraging children mm. uh, to constantly talk about their feelings, mm. to say whatever's on their mind, to always ventilate, I think it's part of a, a larger demonisation of masculinity, which mm. I know you've discussed right. in this programme. Uh, qualities like stoicism, right. yeah. uh, the ability to withstand okay. hardship and oh. not constantly complain. In the current debate about social media having such a negative effect in some cases on young teenagers, 
and the fact that if you put in certain hashtags, you can see material online, which, you know, I did it yesterday, completely lowered my mood when I looked at it. I wonder in that case whether there is an argument that we should just turn away from that, you know, that, that actually sharing all of that can have a negative effect on your mental health, as much as you think that sharing and talking about your feelings can be a good thing. There can be a moment when it crosses over into being a bad thing and being a bit more resilient helps. I think anything that encourages a teenager to put down their screen and talk about their thoughts mm. and their feelings and their emotions must be a good thing. Mm. They spend too much time on their screens. There is too much damaging material out there anyway. Mm. So can we not gather around the dinner table, sit in the lounge, socialise with our friends and work through our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions and, yes, discuss our issues? Mm. Toby, one of the things which is very relevant in your case, because you've been through this, is we're now in the offence era where everyone is grotesquely offended by absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. And people's lives and careers get trashed. Yours was completely buried for a few months mm -hmm. uh, over this uh, because of old tweets that you'd done which were a bit on the racy side. And it seems to me that we, we've reached a point now where the Oscars apparently may not even have a host because they can't risk appointing somebody because of what's just happened with Kevin Hart, who was bounced out of it over old tweets, who is so squeaky clean that they can't survive the Twitter mob. Mm. What do we do about this over-offended world we now live in, where people can't just be offended, they have to destroy anyone that they feel has Cross disagreed the with them? Mm. Well, I think the, the, the awful atmosphere on sites like Twitter, the viciousness, mm -hmm. the malice, the cruelty that's constantly being exhibited by the users, which make it almost unusable now mm. for ordinary people. Uh, I think that's symptomatic of a lack of self-control, a lack of emotional regulation, yeah. people constantly venting their anger, people frequently sort of looking to take offence. I mean, in my case, people went back, you know, 10 years, yeah. uh, things I'd tweeted, searching, searching desperately for things to be then offended about. I call them offence archaeologists. Mm. They go and dig right. just to look for and reasons it's a real, to then get upset. It's become a real stick to beat people with, Peter. I mean, what worries me is if you spend time with the older generation, I go back with my parents at the weekend, mm. we had a lovely weekend, but, you know, my dad would laugh at all sorts of stuff, and then even he now, in his 70s, is like... Wait, am I allowed to say that or find that funny anymore? And yet what has just been laughed at is funny and humorous and so what? But we've become so prickly and defensive about everything. It seems to me the fun is also, along with all this political correctness, being sucked out of our lives. My life is full of fun. <laughs> my children, my family, the work that I do and enjoy. I've got fun in every corner of my life and I'm deeply, deeply grateful mm -hmm. for that and I realise, realise how lucky I am. Mm. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that I want to poke fun or find fun in something which is offensive. What is offensive is offensive. And if the goalposts have been moved in recent years so that what we laughed at 40 years ago we now frown upon, so be it. But hang on, hang on. When you say so be it, see, my problem with that is there is somebody out there ready to be offended by absolutely everything. And not just offended, but as we see with the Trump debate in America, the Brexit debate here, it's not enough to just have your opinion and disagree with somebody and have an argument, a civilised argument. This is what we used to do. Now you have to scream and hound and silence the other person. And the best way to do that, they've discovered, on all sides of these debates, is actually to be so offended by something that they may have said five, ten years ago that you can use that as a stick to silence them. It's a, but, it's a public look at, shaming. Look at the language and the terminology mm. that was in everyday use 30, 40, 50 mm. years ago and now which is completely frowned upon, in fact, might almost be illegal. But, Toby, That's a good thing. We Peter, don't call yeah. people that. Last words, Toby. One of the difficulties is that the police have now taken it upon themselves to... Um, uh, go after people who they deem to be offensive, even if there have been no complaints. So recently, the Humberside police went after someone for retweeting a, 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 a limerick, right. which, which they said was transphobic. It wasn't actually a hate crime, but they said, we have to monitor mm -hmm. what people are thinking in case their thoughts might be offensive. Surely you think the police should be focusing on dealing with real crimes like assault, burglary, theft, and not wasting their time policing Except social media to make sure people aren't being offensive. Crimes, aren't they? The threats are different. Threats are different. Mm. The, the, these are yes. imagined... They're called something like non-hate, non-crimes. Yeah, yeah. It's mm. ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, and the senior officer responsible for that decision and that potential waste of resources needs to be called to order. 